Breakfast puppies? Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving Game Masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Hi, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And you are again listening to Have Movies Will Game, a periodical podcast where we talk about movies and uh, cool things that you probably don't know about Uh. them in belching. And then how to game those movies, as Isaac probably already told you. But speaking of Isaac, buddy, I'm going to give you a shout out here. Isaac has been going through some hard times lately, and I want to raise a glass to Isaac. Isaac did a fantastic set of voiceovers yes, for he our did. show. Isaac and is our announcer for those of you just tuning in. If you've listened to us this far and you did not skip the intro, <laughs> the you guy have before us, Isaac. Isaac. <laughs> the vastly more inter- entertaining person than any of us are. <laughs> With the long string yeah. of alliteration at one point, which yeah. is, which I liked on that change. I yeah. really do like it. Yeah, he did a good job. He did the voice right. And, you know, Isaac's been going through a hard time and I wanted to give him a shout out and send him some love. So, dear listeners, think of Isaac, send him some love and some good vibes. Uh, some yeah, good otherwise vibes. you'd be listening to our lame voices. Yeah. And that's not good. We tried. No, I tried to yeah. do one. And it was Hi, bad. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Half Movies Will Game. <laughs> Welcome to Half Movies Will Game. I mean, you do listen I can't for like an hour and a half anyways. And I, <laughs> another 30 seconds is, I think, will make people that's just pushing explode (laughs) that 30 (laughs) seconds man yeah but thanks isaac thank you isaac and i hope you do better soon anyway on to the movie what are we watching uh smoking the bandit right that 1977 beautiful beautiful piece of all all it really is is nothing more than a boot uh, a bootleg uh derby it's a car chase it's car chase it's an extended car chase and you know what god bless it yeah god fucking bless it do you know where the idea came from no i don't so the idea uh hal needham who was the director who's also like this big stunt guy in in hollywood he worked with burt reynolds on a couple other movies quite a few actually yeah he was actually working on he was uh burt reynolds stunt double in gator in 1976 gator (laughs) another movie that was on our list and i don't think anybody no uh they actually were really good friends uh apparently hal needham lived in Burt Reynolds' guest house for like 12 years. Thought you were about to became... say he slept on his couch. <laughs> <laughs> and they became really good friends. And the driver on uh, the driver captain on set for Gator had brought some Coors beer from California uh, into Needham's hotel room. What is that all about? Wait a second. I'll, I'll get, I, know where you, I think I know where you're going to go with that, and, I, and I'll get to that. I think Where I know. can't you have beer? Okay, well, I, I, well, I'll tell you why. He had noticed that the maid kept stealing beers from the fridge, and Time Magazine apparently did an article in 1974 about how Coors is unavailable, at that point in time, was unavailable east of the Mississippi River because the beer was not pasteurized and needed constant refrigeration and couldn't legally be sold out of 11 uh, western and southwestern states. So I want to give another shout out here to Heidi Harris, who is an archivist at Coors and a bridesmaid in my upcoming wedding, uh, which is one reason why you might not be hearing us for a few weeks due to scheduling issues. But she sent me a wonderfully typed up write up about Coors Mm -hmm. that uh, I'd like to share with you. It's very short. Uh, the story of the Coors Sorry about what steep. I said about Coors earlier. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> she, she knows I'm not really fond of the beer either, but, you know, whatever. Brand loyalty. You kind of got to show the people you work for. We don't work for Coors, but Heidi does. So say whatever you want at and, that and point. And thanks for sending <laughs> to us. The story of the Coors Mystique started in World War II. This is when all breweries in the U.S. had to send half of their production overseas to help keep up morale with the troops. Many of the men from the East Coast had their first taste of Coors beer during this time. When the war was over, they returned home to find they could not buy Coors beer in their home states. Up until 1948, Coors was only distributed in 11 states. 
So this is when people would start driving to Colorado to buy Coors beer and then smuggle the cases home in their cars. It was illegal for many reasons. Many states have their own alcohol laws where beer had to be only 3.2 alcohol percent per volume. It is illegal to drive alcohol across state lines when that product is not distributed in that state. And by law, a consumer cannot sell alcohol. It has to be from a licensed alcohol store. So this is when the Coors Brewery realized they needed to start the expansion process into other states. So their beer was sold on their own terms and legally. All right. Cool. Yeah. And movies like this were kind of like part of the the, the big appeal to it. And, and Needham realized, hey, bootlegging Coors would make a great plot line for a movie. Bam, you have Smokey and the Bandit. Did sponsor this at all? Or? No. No. <laughs> it just happened to be that one. Yeah, the one. it just okay. happened to be there. I get the feeling that there were a lot of missed sponsorship opportunities in this movie. The yeah. the uh, <laughs> the biggest one that obviously came from it was from Pontiac with oh, yeah. Trans Am. Yeah. Initially, I really want a Trans Am after watching this. Initially, so the director went to to Pontiac and said, "Hey, I have this movie. Can you give me like I think it was either ten or twelve Trans Ams, and we need you know like ten Bonnevilles also." And they said, "No, you get three Trans Ams and like two Bonnevilles." And those three Trans Ams by the end of the movies, they were not running. The end scene where he's like they're coming in with the truck that had to be pushed by another car and then stopped and let and let the Trans Am roll because <laughs> it could not run anymore. One was destroyed by the jump, that beautiful jump, the uh, bridge jump. Yeah, the the bridge jump. The bridge uh, jump was nice, they, which they actually took out the Pontiac engine and put a Chevrolet engine in it to give it more oomph. And then to give it even <laughs> more oomph, they strapped an evil Knievel jet booster under on the underside of it so it could make that that jump without going straight into the river because of, you know, physics and everything. Like the cop cars do. Yeah. Because cop cars have no jet boost. Exactly. <laughs> and then going through all the ditches and everything, those those cars were so badly destroyed by the end of the movie. <laughs> Fuck, it looked fun, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a smorgasbord of wonderful car driving delight. Yeah, it wasn't... Yeah. It was, it's not an off-road vehicle though, and he does a lot of no. I like the, hey, want to go want to go pond jo- jumping, and they yeah. go through they go through the river with it. There are a lot of cars that ended up in water in this. Oh, I, yeah. I, th- I think that's its own running joke. That uh, <laughs> whenever whenever you're in hot pursuit, there's always like a handy pond nearby and a jump. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> what was that one guy who that that uh, I think it was in Mississippi or something? I didn't even know that pond was there. <laughs> <laughs> This, <laughs> although I, we we talked about it uh, when we did uh, John Wick. If you're going to make like an action movie, have like the stunt guy direct it. And this is like another oh, yeah. case of it because this was the lead stunt man for a number of movies. And he's like, "Fuck it, I can make a movie." <laughs> and so we watched this on Amazon Prime. I imagine everybody. I have the Blu-ray copy of it. I watched it on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Did you take the time to watch the trailer? Yes. No, no, I didn't. The trailer was fucking funny. Oh, <laughs> they they start out with like uh, the kissy kissy face face. Yeah, yeah. And they're like a man and a woman talking about their feelings in cars, going to cars. I literally can't get any closer. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just it cuts to all the car shit. <laughs> and I mean, for the time that that was a pretty it was a pretty good send up. It was it was a pretty good misdirect. I liked it. I liked that. It was almost like a Ryan Reynolds intro. It was it was spot on. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was nothing. <laughs> okay. All right, that's the so movie, guys. The, yeah, <laughs> so this movie made, uh, we said a few moments ago, this movie actually made the, the Trans Am a superstar because it was beginning to kind of fail and fade out because they didn't have a new a new body design. But Trans Am sales had jumped from just shy of 70,000 units in 1977 to 93,000 in 1978. The Trans Am is the official car of the year I was born. Yeah. The I, Trans Am is the car that I remember the most from my childhood. Oh, that you have was this Night Rider. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just being what a was kid. the Firebird? Yeah. Was that also Pontiac? Pontiac. Yeah, that was Pontiac. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, so in the sequel to this, they have the, the, the Firebird because mm-hmm. it's got the four, the four, slanted lights up front and this yeah. one had more of the 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 bird eyes and then in the third one they had the night rider one which is where um the uh, snowman became the bandit in the third movie which is just fucking and not to confuse our listeners but there was a time especially in the late 70s and most of the 80s where people would get paint trans ams 
and put the Pontiac Firebird on the hood. Mm-hmm. It was just yeah, a common that was thing. thing. Yep. To the point that you almost couldn't tell them apart. That's, unless I still you knew have you trouble yeah. to this yeah. day. Yeah. I love yeah. his fucking laugh in this. <laughs> that, that's his normal laugh, I think. I that's in like every movie. Well, the thing is, is that half even this in movie, Archer, he does it. I was going to say, Archer. Okay. Fanfic moment. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that Burt Reynolds is Archer's dad. I was just about oh, to say, yeah. is it? Isn't that confirmed? That, 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 that's I what that is, right? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I've, I don't, I don't think it's confirmed because I've watched every season of Archer, and I don't Spend some remember. Time in the forums, but well, okay, it's not. That's not a rabbit hole I go down too far. I mean, I've, I've heard that theory, but you know, I forums can be toxic of this. cesspits of evil. Is yes. that a good one? So what else are you going to do with your life? Write books, watch movies, do podcasts, jerk off. I don't know. Mm-hmm. All yeah. that stuff is good. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I could. I would totally believe that that Burt Reynolds is. Oh, wait, Archer's I forgot. Father. You guys read it at normal speed. Yeah, that's I'm gotta, not. I'm not. I'm that's got to be horrible. I'm not a weird alien that reads like five books a night that are George R. R. Martin sized. Read somewhere between the two of you. I skim a lot. I, I just I, somewhere I between. What do you think? I'm a slow reader. No, I, I, don't I think you're probably the one a, to say it. But those are your words, not mine. I think you're, <laughs> I gather that you're a normal reader who okay. likes to appreciate the book. Yeah. Me, I hate filler. So I'm just like, skip, 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 skip. I've, especially when a writer is like, does this thing with a book that I'm reading right now. And I'm not going to say its name because it's got a good story, but I hate the way you're writing it. <laughs> and it's that the writer, every time the character has like an internal monologue about another character, the writer spends like a paragraph reestablishing shit we already know. Never oh, it's read just like, David Weber. Not ever. It's just Don't like, David oh, she turned to her friend who she just went through this ordeal with. I'm like, I was fucking there. <laughs> I know you did that. No, I right now I'm I'm reading about <sighs> a book a week. Nothing fast, nothing major. And I know that's a pittance level compared to your like five. Anyway, a I'm night. just I'm just saying that I can get through a forum in like <laughs> an hour. A <laughs> no, not five a night, but I, I can read a six, seven hundred page book a night. Okay. This is what I want to do. Movie aside, let's set it aside for a second. We're already talking about books here. So, Matthew, I want to find some books that I haven't read Mm -hmm. and get you to read them in a night. Okay. And then drink a bottle of old granddad and tell me the story. This is going to be like drunk history, but just drunk storytelling. It's going to be drunk speed reading. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I I, I could. That's a whole podcast we could do. Or we could do it the other way around. You drink a bottle of old granddad. How about you drink the old bottle of old granddad? (laughs) Read the book. And then the next day, tell us what the book was about. (laughs) It's hard because I got to tell you, after you drink a bottle of old granddad, your eyes don't work quite right. (laughs) We could call it Granddad's Book Corner. <laughs> I just, I don't see this being a long running show. And then the hopefully old failure. Granddad will sponsor that one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that would be the death of me. <laughs> so, uh, old let's Granddad, if you're looking to sponsor a podcast, please let us know. <laughs> God, yes, please. Because <laughs> all anyway. it will be, will be just drinking a bottle of Old Granddad every session and having Matthew tell us about what if he If you read. don't have time to watch uh, Smokey and the Bandit, uh, you can actually... Uh, watch the uh, the Archer, uh, <laughs> season five, episode five, um, about the uh, Queen of Outlaw Country, Charlene. Mm-hmm. It's it's basically the same thing, except instead of course, it's cocaine, and uh, instead of a off road rodeo, it is uh, it's uh, some sort of country music. Thing. Hey, you know what would be better right now? Cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pow. <Pam. laughs> Pam is why you watch that show. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, Pam's pretty The good. shit that comes out of her mouth. I can't tell who Swoosh. I like more, Pam yeah. or Cheryl. I, it's a little bit of column A, a little bit yeah. of column B. And, and what? Babu? You, <laughs> the ocelot? <laughs> you could drown a toddler in my panties. <laughs> so Burt Reynolds wants to jump her. And by jump her, what does he mean by that? Well, what do you think he means, Matthew? Sounds I, like I, rape to me. Well, okay. Like, I want to bear you down and jump you. I, no, I mean, I, I like mean, he says it like four times. I think it was basically. I just, just want to have sex with you. Yeah, okay. essentially, it's just a crude way of saying, "Yeah, I'd fuck you. I'll jump I your mean, bones." Honestly, there are. This movie is guilty of seventiesisms, which you <laughs> well, know, seventies. Yeah, it's not as bad as, shall we say, Ice Pirates on certain regards. Yeah, that was. However, bad. Uh, it is still pretty sexist at times. But I do think that Sally Field's character was. Not too diminished in the story. She was a good driver. Yeah. 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 And she looked great in 70s pants. God bless 70s pants. Yeah. 
Also, her introduction wasn't like damsel in distress. It was kind of turned around. It was just her, like her banter. Hey, you, yeah, yeah, stop. Yeah, come like, get <laughs> yeah, in. Get I'm getting. I'm running away from this because I just yeah. don't want the to. The banter back and forth is really what what raised this movie from something bad into something decent. Well, the banter was uh, so most of the script um, didn't make it into the movie. Apparently, most every single line is ad libbed, particularly from Jackie Gleason. The bantering back and forth between. Sally Field and Burt Reynolds, that became, because they were on set for so long, they ended up in a relationship for five years. So now that bannering is like true to form for them. Jackie Gleason devoured every scene he was in. Mm-hmm. Devoured the scenery. Yeah. He, he would just ate it, ate it up like he ate that Diablo sandwich. So why is that okay? But in Robin Hood, the sheriff isn't okay. I, I, oh. I have to ask because you you have... I, I know you liked him there, uh, Jackie Gleason, but you hated Alan Rickman in doing doing pretty much the same thing. Thought, so why was this is, it? This is this is a tough one. I got to think about it. You're right. It's a good point. I felt that Rickman was trying too hard, and I felt that Re- Gleason was just doing what Gleason does. I think they just got him drunk, and they just said talk. <laughs> well, <laughs> the funny thing about your comment about drunk is that. Um, it was widely known that he had a very a personal assistant throughout the whole movie that was just on the other side of the camera. And in between takes, he would say, boy, get me a hamburger. And that hamburger was a bottle of bourbon. So he would drink like half a bottle in between takes. And everybody knew that hamburger meant bourbon. So they once pulled him aside. Like, why? We all know that you're drinking. Why? Why don't you say, "Give me a, give me another glass, or give me a bottle of bourbon"? He spent a lot of time behind the wheel. If he was, <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, because yeah, I, I don't want anybody to know that I'm drinking. And it's like, you, you, you're drinking. I don't think that the, the main actors drove all that much because I was watching it, and so many of the scenes of them actually driving or moving really fast. And if you pause it and look, you're like, mm-hmm. "That's not Sally. That's a man." Yeah, <laughs> and, well, like the scene where she, when Sally Fields looks down, goes, "Are we going 110 miles an hour?" And the camera stops on the speedometer real quick. If you pause it, it's on 110 kilometers an hour, so they're doing 55 miles an hour. Yeah. So, you know, 60 miles an hour. Um, so that was funny, but most of the scenes where, you know, they're up front, they did that, that seventies setup of putting a car on a flatbed truck and driving the flatbed yeah. truck around. Even, yeah. even snowman's truck, his cab was on a flatbed truck and he was being driven around. Oh, well, they were also doing the classic movies driving where they just sit there in place and turn their hands mm-hmm. back and forth. Did you guys notice his girdle? <laughs> Burt Reynolds girdle? No. Okay, so I thought I saw red, something. Red yeah. shirt, yeah. There was tight like, pants, yeah, yeah. There was a line across his his, uh, okay. his belly, and when they're down by the river, and in the the one romance scene, which was tastefully done, just a kiss. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, fade to the Take firelight. Your head off. <laughs> fade to the firelight. We don't need to see him fucking. Yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I wish we did that more often these days. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah, you can totally see the line of his girdle. <laughs> I I thought is, it was like a fair. wallet. I thought it was one of those like seventies. No, because it's like both in, sides of the belly. I didn't see the other side. I yeah. only saw it on one. So um, yeah. Now to be fair, those clothes are painted on, oh, and yeah. in order to fit in it, I mean, you have to. If you've had a burger last week, that's going to show <laughs> against what they put the poor bastard in. Did you catch how much those burgers cost him? Oh my god! Two burgers for two, buck fifty two and an iced tea. A and an iced tea for a. Buck fifty at what did they call it? Uh, the, uh, the, the choking, the choking, choking uh, puke, choking puke. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Did you also see ga- uh, diesel was like fifty seven cents a gallon? Like he filled he, snowman filled his entire truck for seventy bucks. Yeah, seventy bucks, two hundred gallons for seventy dollars. That doesn't happen today. No, but you know, being fair. Now it's like, like you 70 made, gallons for you $200. Maybe 75 cents an hour. Yeah. So the the $80,000 wager that Little and Big, um, Enos? Yeah. Enos. Yeah, Enos. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that would have been $345,000 so today. Pat, Pat uh, Mc, Mc, McCormick. Uh, yeah, Pat McCormick played Big Enos and Paul Williams, uh, Little Enos. Oddly enough... Uh, little Enos was only like is only 13 years younger than Pat McCormick when they did this movie, so he wasn't really his kid. I mean, you could be precocious. It is the South. Well, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> 13 years. That's <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's so that's, that 80, that hits home. <laughs> and the original the original script wasn't um, 
wasn't supposed to be. I'm just shocked to, be... to find out there is a script. Oh, if, I know. If we're being perfectly honest. It was written on a, a, written on a yellow legal pad. And so they uh, had paper. I'm surprised. <laughs> and paper when, bound. You know, the seventies weren't that long ago, Matthew. Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I just thought this was cocktail napkins. Or <laughs> <laughs> and when Needham went to Burt Reynolds, Burt Reynolds was like, This is the worst script I have ever read. I'll fucking do it. This is beautiful. And he wanted to do it just as a joke. Now, the 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 initial budget for the movie, Universal said We'll give you five point one million dollars to do this. That and, seems about and right. And the day that that they started filming, the Hatchet Man came in and immediately cut one point five million dollars off. I mean, that. seriously, they didn't build any sets. No, they, they just, just wrecked a lot of things. Not even like mailboxes. I mean, the back of a of Honey a truck. X. <laughs> yeah, and Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds took one million. That was his. So yeah. right off the bat, he did. Yeah. He took one million. Yeah, I, I could, I could make that movie for this today. Yeah, I well, mean, so I could live off of that today. Yeah, we all could. So the the budget for the movie ended up being four point three million total, um, which today would have been eighteen million. So that that's that's an independent film. Okay, today. I can make it for half of that <laughs> minus Burt Reynolds. The opening weekend was one point seven million dollars. That Matthew, was you. You're just not going to have Burt Reynolds, which. <sighs> Sorry. Is 7.3 million today. Gross USA for the movie run was 126 million or oh, made money. 504 million in today's money. Uh cumulative worldwide half a billion. Cumulative. Wait, wait, wait. Wait a minute. Wait God. a minute. Cumulative worldwide gross in 1977 to 78 made 300 million dollars, which would have been 1.2 billion dollars today. So Pontiac gave them all the cars they wanted for the second one. <laughs> yes. right? Yeah, they, yeah. Needham apparently Just drove said up a fleet. They asked, they asked for like twenty five of Bonnevilles, twenty five mm-hmm. Le Mans, twenty five Trans Ams, and they gave them all. They said, yeah, "Yeah, here you go, not a problem." And if you wreck them, fuck it, don't even worry about it. Yeah. So, how about uh, CB Radio companies? Yeah, seriously, did um, any of them I, profit I, off of this? I, this is the first no, time I they didn't give any this. names on it. Oh. This is the first time I watched this, but uh, I have to say, CBs were a huge part of my my hillbilly growing up, and I think that was because of this movie because we used them like this too. Yeah. This is pre cell phone, so well, we used them a lot on 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 our Jeep runs. We go in within the Land Cruiser and everything. Yeah, we this... would we would actually like various cars having CBs in high school. And we would surround a car that was annoying us or it'd cut one of us off and then all slow down. Like four of us would box this person in on the freeway and slow down to like 35 <laughs> until they absolutely freaked out. Did that a few times. This movie, to me, when I was watching it, I kept thinking, this is a pre-internet internet movie. Yeah. It has the same flow, the same style of when, when 1995 or so happened and Hollywood learned what the internet was. Lawn and dis- man. And oh, decided God. to put in those levels of direct communication between the characters that had never happened before. This movie was that. This yeah. was like, hey, new communication technology. We're going to have everyone talk to everyone all the time and make it a plot device. This was this was an internet movie, but it was just wasn't the internet. Yeah, if that makes any sense. I'm, uh, but the, do the, communication yeah. majors have to study yeah. this movie? I just don't the know. whole they should. <laughs> yeah. It was essentially if you would take out the cars and you put them in an internet chat room, it was essentially the same damn thing. Like they they were just calling upon these anonymous people who they'd never met before, who only knew them from their CB tags. They're just or call signs. Yeah. They're just yeah. hey I, hey hey buddy, you're in my neighborhood. I'm gonna help you out. Yeah, ah. <laughs> it was awesome. So. Or you put it to yeah to, to even even what Ready Player One could have could have basically been this, or yeah. this could have been yeah later on. So, any do movie... any of you have a CB in your car? Because I do. I don't. I don't. I need. To, I need to put the one in the. Oh well, that's fair. <laughs> the the one that was in the gold cruiser I haven't put in in the black cruiser yet, so I do need to put one in. But in the, my my white land cruiser, I have a CB. Because in today's day and age, folks, you'll be very disappointed if you put a CB. Mm-hmm. And after watching this movie, it's, yes. it's not like that anymore. Well, also, I've, I know that many of the slangs have changed their meanings over time. Do like not choke say, and puke. Do not say good buddy over a trucker CB. Just don't. Yeah. It means something else now. You can look it up later. 
<laughs> Did you know that this movie uh, was nominated for an Oscar? What? What? Yep. 1978 <laughs> for best what? film editing. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. What, for the seventies, what was yeah. it against? God, yeah. I don't know. I didn't yeah. look it up. I just I couldn't stop laughing for Did like three minutes. No, it was. Well, nominated. I figured if it won, you probably would have said it won. No, Oscar. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not a bad movie. No, and I really like. I think you know, Burt Reynolds and Sally Fields. The interplay between the two of them made the movie. No, uh, they were you, dating you, too. You had you had your ridiculous cop, which is fairly standard for the time. Um. But it was just it was the the wit passing back and forth between the two of them is what raised this movie above, you know, Death Race 2000 or some other piece of human garbage. So one of the things because they, they knew this was going to be put on later on, it was going to go on to like TV, uh, commercial TV. So everyone came back to redub their lines just to make sure that there was no for for, for the censors uh, issues, except Jackie Gleason, because, you know, he said some bitch a lot and, you know complained about his kid's mother a whole bunch you're like i'm gonna, yeah, punch, gonna, your, slap her I'm gonna punch your mother in the mouth that you know? line <laughs> was just he had, i'm gonna punch your mama in the mouth okay i'm gonna let you finish but that line was that surprised the fuck out of me and it ended that scene i was like what a way to close a scene jackie he didn't wow. go back he was like fuck it because i'm jackie gleason i don't have to go back and do that right to the moon <laughs> and so they got the guy that did uh the voice for fred flintstone to overdub all because he based fred flintstone off of jackie gleason yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. so he was the perfect person to come in and and you know change some of those words around and then change some of those insults so they could put it on commercial tv at nine o'clock at night so, but yeah, you could, you could definitely tell that there'd been a lot of, even going back because the mics did suck in some areas of this movie, there was a lot of redub for it. Do you have any, uh, example of lines that were overdubbed from the Fred Flintstone actor? Uh, pretty much everything where he says some bitch. <laughs> what do you say? Some, some gun? Some bub, some gun. Some bub. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. One of the things that I liked was that scene where he's just giving that highway patrolman a beat down i'm dead oh yeah we're and I'm poking him man in the hands over and over murdered several people he, blah, 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 blah. And then she's like all right now fuck off <laughs> but the but the, the horn wheeler goes <laughs> yeah. by right at that time <laughs> it was beautiful so he based buford t justice off of burt a friend of burt reynolds father apparently who acts just like that oh, that's unfortunate yeah I wonder how that happened. <laughs> Did he and Bert know each other well enough to know each other's dads? Just... Well, there was apparently a little bit of, of, of grief between Bert Reynolds and Jackie Gleason. There was a, a lot more scene time between the two of them, you know, just, I mean, next to each other, in front of yeah. each other. And Jackie Gleason apparently did not like any of those scenes. So he forced the director to cut those and then rewrite some of the scenes. What so that the they fuck were... is up with that? I mean, how, how do people get off doing that? I, I think what it probably is is that is that Jackie Gleason or or an actor actress that is that was prominent for two decades coming in in the twilight of their of their um, experiences and or their movie popularity going up against someone that's a rising star. I mean, we talked about this with with Clint Eastwood and, and John Wayne, where it John really, Wayne was like, I'm not going to fucking do say, this movie. I gotta say, though, it really fucking pisses me off. Yeah, because you, you get paid me millions of dollars to show up and play make-believe. And you get catered to, and you get to do fun things. And you get to be drunk on set. And you get to be drunk on set and call it hamburgers. <laughs> and, I mean, just don't be a little bitch about it. You know, I don't get to do that at my job. Yeah. I don't get to be a bitch about the people that I work with. Well, I, I actually do, but at the same time. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I work, I, I get paid a decent amount of money and I can't just be like, well, you know what? We had that meeting, but I'm just not going to have that meeting today because yeah, I don't gonna... like that guy. We, I can't do that. So I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's obnoxious and it, it spells the death of an actor, I think. Like that, that's, that's the being downside. A prima donna. Yeah. When, when, they, when they decide... That they are too big or too important to fucking do what they are paid to do, then fuck them. No one wants to work with them anymore. Yeah. I certainly <laughs> wouldn't. Nicely done on that. Oh, thank you. That yeah, was a good get one. That a solid A. That Coors, man. Whew. The 1936 W bottle. When they go, 
at the very beginning uh, on the forklift when they're ripping off all the cores. And he goes crashing off the forklift. And into the, the boxes bottle. are empty. And the boxes yeah. are all empty. <laughs> Fuck. You know, not like only said, were they bootlegging, they were thieves. Yeah, they're yeah. breaking and entering <laughs> everything. Yeah, breaking and entering, kidnapping, transporting across state lines. Well, the kidnapping was... That was not a thing. Not really. That didn't really happen because she sort of stopped him and got in his car on yeah. her own. However, the breaking That's more and of a hijacking, if yeah. you yeah, yeah, on her. Yeah, 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 yeah. She hijacked him. She yeah. hijacked him. And then tried to steal his car. And it shows what you can yeah. do in a tight pair of 70s pants. This is you true. You can hijack, and then they'll end up loving you and being in a five-year relationship and putting you in the next movie. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Every movie that the, for that, like, Those five pants. years, if it was a Burt Reynolds movie, Sally Field was pretty much in it. Kind of like uh, Clint Eastwood uh, in the Dirty Harry movies, his wife, the woman who later played his wife, the blonde, she was in a whole bunch of movies with him. I don't remember her name. I'm going to be using 10100. <laughs> that's that's to piss. What, not 10200? <laughs> well, no, I try not to shit in another person's house. I think that's just rude. <laughs> Are you saying we need to take a 10-100 break? No, no, no. Okay. I'm just, I'm saying that is going in Matthew's personal lexicon. <laughs> I like it. I'm good with it. What else you got? There isn't much to talk about. It's, no, there's it really not. Movie. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was straight to the point. Uh, the original screenplay, Bennett's last name is LaRue. It's never really mentioned. Carrie's uh, name is Kate. Cletus's handle was basically just Bandit 2, which I like Snowman more. Um. That, yeah. He, at the very beginning, he does be like oh, Bandit Two, and then he's never called that again for the rest of the movie. Yep. But yeah, there's there's not a. I mean, this is just a fun movie. There's not a lot to mind. Yeah, there's, there's no there's no plot devices. Yeah, it's there's not no deep. underwhelming themes. There's there's nothing. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a car chase. I, yeah. I I rewatching it. I did like the the romantic interlude, kind of the breakaway, the the moment. Hey, let's we have a moment to relax. We're in the forest. And, and and then Let's getting fuck. yeah, and then getting back on track. And I did like like how you mentioned it. I did like that it was just that that fade to black segue on it. Ah, fuck it, I don't know. It's a great movie. It's fun. It's it is fun. It is car chase. It has characters that just chew the scenery. It's got what what the musician the is the second character. I mm-hmm. mean Jerry well, Reed. Jerry Reed. It, did the music. I think great. we should link to the song. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I can't get it out of my head. He's bounded down. <laughs> Loaded up and trucking. <laughs> oh, so good. All right. You guys want to go ahead and talk about how to game this? Yeah. All right. Let's I'm do good. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 10 4. Good, buddy. Hi, everyone. This is your favorite host, Matthew. This week's episode is brought to you by Guardian Games, who we are proud to have as our sponsor. Guardian Games is Portland's largest gaming store. They have almost every game you can think of, be it role-playing, board game, card games, miniature games, even video games. They also have a ton of gaming-related material and some pretty neat swag. I mean, the D20 fuzzy dice that go in your mirror, that's good stuff. If uh, (laughs) if you're 21, uh, you can have a drink in the back at the Critical Sip. Booze makes gaming better. Always has, always will. There's free games back there. You'll love it. Uh, They also have a friendly and incredibly knowledgeable staff, and they are the hub of a diverse and friendly gaming community. Um, If you're in Portland, you definitely want to go to Guardian Games. All right, Dusty, before we bring this to the table, tell us about the characters of this film. All right. We have the great Burt Reynolds playing the bandit. Also, his real name is Bo Darville. So, Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds. Chaotic, chaotic good. Neutral. I was going to go neutral. Good. Yeah, I was going to go chaotic neutral. Uh, he wasn't a bad person. I yeah. don't really think he... I mean... I think he was primarily good. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he did steal. I would definitely say laws. chaotic. Okay, like, okay, yeah, definitely chaotic. Yeah. But okay, I will change that then. Yes. Here's a here's a note about alignments: is that there's some that we're almost never going to see. Neutral good, I don't think we're ever going to see because it's not an interesting alignment for mm. a character in a movie. Like if you think about neutral good, it's just like, oh, I'm just good. That's it. 
Like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really, you know, I'm not chaotic well, about it, but I'm not lawful about it. I just do good things. Well, that's, You're an that, NPC. That's what, what I are. thought he was, though, yeah. because he wasn't lawful. But he wasn't particularly chaotic. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's the bandit. He was using CB network to circumvent the law. He was stealing. He was driving like a loony bin. Like, uh, that's chaos. That is pure chaos. I think that's just yeah. a... No, I mean... You said Robin Hood was chaotic good, but not the bandit. He wasn't Robin Hood. Yeah, he I was, know. He was stealing for himself. Yeah, exactly. That's even more chaotic. <laughs> like, come on. He was <laughs> the he way was definitely he drove chaotic, with a yeah. passenger, the no seatbelt. And yeah, wasn't required by law at that point. Yeah. I know, but still, it was it's, it's a chaotic thing to do. <laughs> then we have Sally Field playing Carrie, or also known as Frog. Chaotic good again. Yeah, I would say chaotic good. For I would her, definitely, definitely say chaotic yeah. good. Especially her backstory. The, There's only really two more. Yeah. Like, well, her, her yeah, thing was. I, so just to be clear, she left Buford Jr. Mm-hmm. Right. right, the idiot in the car. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who was easily 35. Well, Maybe what, older. From what I understand, wasn't he, didn't his character not even exist until Jackie Gleason yeah. put him in the story? Yeah, Jackie Gleason yeah. wanted, he didn't want to be in the car alone. <laughs> so he wanted somebody to play off of. So that created Junior. And he what he wasn't like really a big part of the the screen actors guild yet so he had to have minimal lines yeah and uh he was also uh he got his start in acting he was a football player for the pittsburgh steelers also he was a linebacker so it was kind of that segue much like um sloth did with goonies he was he was in in uh, on the raiders who also played one of the guys in ice pirates you know the big the big burly big bearded i would i forget who he played but that was the same guy that played sloth in in Goonies. Wait, wait, wait. That actor? Yeah. Yeah, we covered this in Ice Pirates. Mm-hmm. That actor? Yeah. Was, uh, no, no, no. Not from this movie. Act? He was oh. comparing his. Yeah, com- yeah, comparing. I was comparing. Oh, it's like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. I totally misunderstood oh, okay. what you were saying okay. there. I thought you were saying, I was like, holy shit. He looked different. <laughs> okay. And then we have Jerry Reed playing Snowman. Chaotic good. Yeah, chaotic good again. Definitely chaotic. Motherfucker divorces his wife on the phone before he goes on a road trip at the end of the movie. Yeah. I didn't, maybe he was joking about it. I didn't know. I think he said, he just said, I'm going to be divorced. I'm divorced. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm divorced. Yeah, because they were going to do, go do another, the double or nothing run. So yeah. um, then we have Jackie Gleason playing Sheriff Buford T. Justice, the Smokey. Chaotic neutral. <sighs> Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's not he he's says not he's necessarily lawful. evil, but and he's not lawful. No. He's, he's a not. he is a he is a chaotic purveyor of the law. And he's not good or evil. I, I think he's chaotic neutral. What do you think, Dusty? I don't know on this one. I just chaotic, yes, but I don't <laughs> Was he good? I don't know. There were times where he was good and some and there were times where he was like not good. Name a time he was good. Um, when uh, when he was being polite, when was when that? was that? <laughs> <laughs> when he was saying thank you for a few things after abusing someone. So please name a time when he was good. Okay, then I, uh, then you're right. All right. Okay, was he evil? He was actually I don't very know if he polite. Was evil. So that would make yeah. him. Uh, this is a very simple neutral. diagram. I, I know. There you go. I know. All right, Dusty has decided. I fucking Chaotic hate you neutral. sometimes. He did some crazy. We ass call this shit. logic, Dusty. Yeah. I know you hate it. Or maybe it hurts he, your maybe brain. he was just lawful neutral, but crazy. Because he was pursuing them in pursuit of the law. It was just the law, the law, the law, the law. It was was a sad Moby Dick moment. (laughs) It was was sad. And then we have the NPCs, uh, Junior, his son, and then Big and Little Enos. Yeah, 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 like I said, the red NPCs. Yep. Well, small cast, but we actually had a lot of really fun characters in the background. I mean, we can't really bring them up because they were just throwaway characters. But I like, like the whores. (laughs) <laughs> the, the ones who were in the the RV, oh yeah, the, the traveling the RV. <laughs> the RV. I, I liked the four wheeler club. I liked, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I liked how the motorcycles changed from what was parked outside to the ones they could afford to run over. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, that was a really. I loved that scene though, where, where, where he, he got comes his ass out beat. And he's beat up, but it's one long shot. You. It, well, then it pans a little bit, but he comes out and he looks, but you don't see what he's looking at. 
Yeah. But you see this look in his eye. And suddenly you immediately know what he's going to do. Like you don't even have to follow no. what he's looking at. You're just like You can even get yeah. go like leave the room and know what he's gonna do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that because you hear face. the crunch. Yeah. <laughs> that that's the <laughs> that's the trouble with motorcycles, is that the saddest little Lakar or Hyundai hatchback <laughs> will absolutely destroy an entire motorcycle gang on wheels. I actually, as a biker, felt more pity for that highway patrolman's motorcycle. Oh, that was that went to the water. I felt I felt more sad about that motorcycle than I did the Crunch Twins because those guys were dicks. Yeah, and that guy was just doing his job. I. I thought you were going to talk just about how the bike was was bad. I was, yeah, I know. I just was half expecting to see like because see, I've seen some motorcycles where like pedals will pop out and you have to like pedal start it and then it gets going. That's what I was half expecting to see on that kind of motorcycle. You know, all I noticed was how skinny the tires were. Whether it was that too. the straight head-on shot and he's, he's driving towards what turns out to be the pond, no one knew he was there. Yeah. Um. God damn. Dude, I've seen fatter tires on a on a on a beach cruiser bicycle. I mean, that looks dangerous as fuck. Are you talking about on the Pontiac? No, no the, on, highway on patrol, the highway patrol uh, motorcycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was a tiny that was a dirt motorcycle. Bike motor- yeah. That was well, it wasn't a dirt bike, but it was a very small the motorcycle. Of the tires, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, I remember seeing it, thinking that's uh, that wouldn't cut it today. No, <laughs> oh, no. I loved all the cars that had the words like painted on the side, yeah. highway patrol and painted real well. They got a stencil. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matthew, where does this movie take us next in our gaming story? Oh, this is really easy. Um, You, you find something illegal to transport. You go get it. You bring it back. You dodge cops. You, you, uh, it, it's so easy. I, if, if you're doing it today, it would be cocaine or MDNA, MDMA. But if we follow the uh, movie, it's cocaine or MDMA. No, it's chowder. <laughs> oh, is that code? Is it? <laughs> no, he's literally going to Boston to get yeah. some clam chowder. Um, but which, it could be code. Honestly, you you could do this. Uh, it would small party, three players. You uh, you know, pair in the in the blocker car and biker. It's all about communication. I mean, this is really easy. You pick a cargo, pick a place, go get it, overcome obstacles that the DM throws at you. I think there's a couple ways we could approach it then. We could approach it in the classic, this is an adventuring party game, or we could also take it with the idea of the sheriff being a player character, where you have four players at the table. And it's three against one, where but, but you have characters that are not symmetrical in mm-hmm. that each of them has an ability to influence things in different ways. And one of them has like a lot of uh, chase power. However, uh, think about it the sheriff was essentially ineffectual the whole time uh all he did was cause conflict so i guess yeah he's probably an npc but that's the way i do it otherwise i've played many games where that can be fun i I was just thinking there'd be a fight it it would be bad i just i don't see how and i'm going to learn here very quickly on this one on how this taking this movie can be put into game mechanics i mean if you're if you're sitting if you've got three people that are two two are in the blocker car and one's in the truck what would you continuously roll for like i i roll to go five miles without an incident or how would that how would that work when you talk about if something can be gamed you have to identify what it is that you want to experience at the gaming table now, if you are a player who comes to the table expecting to roll a die for every decision that you ever make, this is probably not going to inspire your games that much. You might have a, a regular game that's going on, and maybe you're a game master who has seen this movie and thinks, you know what, I want to do a car chase. Okay, you can do a car chase. You can make that one scene of one evening and then move on with your life. Mm-hmm. And that's a good amount of inspiration. You don't really need anything more than that. Most systems can, most modern systems that have vehicles probably have rules for a chase. Essentially, this is yeah. protecting the caravan. I mean, you, you could play the theme of this in any kind of, in any kind of movie. Yeah. You uh, could. Any kind of movie, excuse me, any kind of game. The gold caravan is leaving the dwarves down to the lowlands, you know, and you're okay. signed up as the, as the protector of said caravan. This is a good second level f- yeah. feeling kind of. Okay. Kind if, you of put it, if you kind of put more into that aspect, then okay, I can get that then. The subject that I want to 
talk about a little bit further is the concept of uh, conflict resolution. Most traditional role-playing games have what's called a task resolution system, where the conflict at hand is, I want to stab you. What do I roll to see if I hit? I want to pick the lock. What do I roll to see if I succeed at picking the lock? Whereas a lot of other games, especially those of indie or more story focus, have conflict resolution focus, where it's, I want to defeat you. I'm going to roll to see how that happens. I want to get a secret. I'm going to roll to see how I acquire that secret. Or I want to access that chest because I believe there's something good. I believe there's something cool in it. I'm going to roll the dice to see if there's something cool in there. Where, you know, if I fail the roll, that means maybe I couldn't get into it or maybe I do get into it, but there's nothing of value in that. However, if I succeed at the roll, it could mean I don't get into it, but I find out there is something valuable in it. And I've managed to take the chest with me, or it means I open it and I find something cool. So conflict resolution focus, there's there's a lot of different approaches to it, but essentially it gives you that ability to kind of focus less on the what exactly we're doing and more on the why we're doing it and create a story result based on that. I'm kind of, I guess maybe I'm, I'm caught in the old school system. I, I see this as a game of attrition where your car starts out with a certain number of hit points, life points, mechanical points. Well, I'm going to turn this fast U-turn because he's coming up behind me. I'm going to have to go off-road because the truck's on this side. You look down at the miniatures. The truck is on this side. Mm -hmm. So I'm going off the embankment. That's going to take one off your shocks, kind of like a mech warrior thing where you're dealing with heat sinks and things things of that oh, nature. I can see that. That'd be yeah. good, yeah. Um, I can see that. But you're you're talking more about a situational... Because to me, when I see this in my head, this is a miniatures game done on an erasable board with Hot Wheels. <laughs> so you're talking about the game I, Car Wars. I like that. I am talking. I love Car Wars. Car Wars is, is good. That, yeah. Is that Kenzer again? No, no. I think Who it's did Car Wars. I think it's Steve Jackson. Yeah, Steve oh, Jackson's okay. Car Wars. Yeah, yeah. And there's a. They even have a role playing game attached to it called Auto Duel. I think I could be wrong. Listeners, please correct us if I am. Uh, NPC and have movies with game dot com. <laughs> <laughs> did we ever look at those? Do we ever find out if we had a working email? He, we do. No, we I, do. I verified it. We have. Is emails. there anything in it? No. God you, damn you, you people! Know. You would have received it already. All right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I could see this being uh, a very traditional style of game where you're rolling for every driving roll. You're rolling for every encounter. You're 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 literally going through and rolling your d twenty against your driving skill for every tight turn that you make. You've got rulers and, and tape measures set out and you're like mapping out the course. I can see that being fun for some people. Otherwise, I can Matthew's see, raising his hand. I can see other people <laughs> playing this and being like, I'm more interested in the story and the characters and what they're doing. And I simply just want to single roll the entire car chase kind of stuff. It's kind of the opposite. So we got some recommendations for systems that uh, I posted online. As you usually do. And this time I want to give some call outs to people that gave me some really cool recommendations of things that we could use. Uh, what was that? Damn. Was that a yawn burp? <laughs> wow. That was like an inhaling burp. Is there a fart in there? That sounded like <laughs> something that would come from Big Trouble in Little China. One of those, <laughs> it was like a low pan. <laughs> Coors <beer>. Golden <laughs> Banquet beer. How was that banquet? Was it tasty? <laughs> Yeah, it was a four dollar banquet. It reminds me of those old Snickers commercials for feast. When we feast, oh, oh, they had like a Viking and a cleric, and uh, I think Robin Hood, and it was just fucking weird. Julius Caesar and a Hawaiian. It was those are the weirdest commercials. Longtime listener Jerome has immediately recommended Fate, saying, "I mean, besides Fate, uh, because I irrationally love Fate for everything." <laughs> uh, I would bet that Apocalypse World would work pretty well, and there's even a playbook for drivers. And Jerome, I got you covered there, but we'll talk more on that in just a bit. Echoing Jerome's recommendation was a new Twitter contact, the OCC Stevie, who says, Fate, the only way to manipulate 1,000 miles of highway into comedic scenario 
opposition or opportunities. I don't know what oppos means. A number of other games were recommended. Anything from Car Wars, yes. which multiple people recommended, to GURPS, Auto Duel, to Spycraft, and more. Um, I'm going to go back uh, one of our f- first episodes, uh, the District 13, where we had one game system that you kind of like described what you were doing. And then you were shoot. Yes, I think that would probably do well, maybe on with just with the cars. Like, I'm going to describe what my car is going to do and roll the dice. Wushu would be amazing. Someone else, I think, might have recommended it, but I, I lost track. I okay. actually got so many recommendations that I'm sorry if I didn't remember who recommended Wushu. So that's two. Okay. Dusty backs you up, whoever you are. <laughs> Woohoo! And someone actually recommended Dread. I don't. Oh, Jesus. Dread was the Jenga Tower game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I, I just don't see it. I, I think they might have been joking. I don't know. All they simply responded was Dread. Dread. So whoever you are, I think you're fucking with me. <laughs> <laughs> but finally... Thanks to Varchild, Just Jacob, Tony Tucker, No Sleeves McGee, and Skin Slip for all suggesting and introducing me to what I believe is the real winner. So it's not Car Wars, I take it. It is an apocalypse world based game called Ba-ba-ba-bum. The Spirit of 77. Oh, that looks right. That cover <laughs> is goddamn gorgeous. <laughs> and there's a Barracuda on the front, there's too. A fucking the 1973 yeah. Barracuda. <laughs> its disclaimer is to be played at maximum volume. I want to get a copy of this just for the artwork. Oh, wow. The fuck? It's just there's a giant robot attacking yeah. a 1970 city being beat up by a Kung Fu master. It's what's the, what's the name of this again? This is called The Spirit of 77. I'm going to read the little bit of intro here. All right. The best parts of a bad decade. Evil Knievel and Pam Greer, Alice Cooper and Bruce Lee, the Dukes of Hazard, and the $6 million man. Shaft. Spirit of 77 is a combination of muscle cars and Mack trucks, CB radios and Kung Fu fighters, cross-country road racers, and big scores in the big city with a killer soundtrack. Can you dig it? Oh, God. It can do a variety of games. However, I am quite certain that Spirit of 77 is what I would run if I was going to run Smokey and the Bandit. What's the play like? Let me talk a little bit about the game mechanics of Apocalypse World games. I've mentioned them before. I'll do a quick review oh, this is, I'm sorry. You did already say this is Apocalypse World. You have a character with five stats. Each stat ranges anywhere from... It averages uh, zero, minus one, plus one sometimes plus one or minus two, occasionally plus three or minus three, and most heinously, very rarely, you might have something with a plus four. What that translates to is throughout play, whenever you want to overcome a conflict, you're going to pick up two six-sided dice. You're going to roll them, and you're going to add them together, and you're going to add your number. For example, in Apocalypse World, you have a stat called HOT. Let's say you have a hot of plus two. You're an attractive person who's good at getting what they want from people. The GM says, uh, okay, w- tell me what you're doing. And you say, oh, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and work my way into the party so I can get close to um, to the star rapper who's having his own VIP room so I can get some information from him. And he's going to be like, all right, so I need you to roll plus hot. So what that means is you roll 2d6 and you add your hot stat of plus two. Well. Hold on. Let's do it right now. 2d6. So I rolled a six. So that makes a hot. That makes a total roll of seven. So that's going to fall right in the middle. So with an Apocalypse eight. World game, you have two. Wait, sorry, eight. Yeah. With an Apocalypse World game, you have two. Sorry, three outcomes. If your total die roll is a 10 plus, you get everything you want sometimes and then some. Wow. If your roll is a seven eight or nine you get some but you got to give some there's usually a negotiation or you worm your way into the party to get to the hot wrapper but you have to put out or you worm your way in to get to the the hot wrapper but the guy who's uh but but his girl one of the girls that's hanging out with them recognizes you as the cop that busted her last week kind of thing 
Oh. Yeah. And calls you out on, on the spot once you're in there. So you achieved your goal of getting in, but now you're in a tight spot or something. And then finally, with a six or less, the GM fucks you. Not literally, but essentially they have be a full, lot cooler. Be a lot cooler <laughs> if you did. They have <laughs> whose bowling ball is this? <laughs> Cheers, man. With a six or less, the GM makes what's called a hard move. <laughs> hmm. The GM gets to essentially do whatever they want. They have the mechanical authority to. I mean, there's never a mechanic. So whenever you take an apocalypse world game based, they're called powered by the apocalypse. Whenever you take one, they always have their moves written. On a ten plus, this happens. On a six or a seven to nine, this happens. And they never say what happens on a six or less because it's implied the GM does whatever the hell they want. And the GM actually has a set list of like things that you might want to consider doing when someone gets fucked. And when someone misses, I think it's what the general term is. And it's simply hit as hard and as fast as you want. Yeah. Sounds like there's not a lot of shades of gray. It's like you barely succeed. You critical fail twice or you critically succeed twice. It's two ones meh, or two twenties. Yeah. Essentially, it's a you get what you want. Mm -hmm. And then more. Not always. Depends. Sometimes it's and then more. So powered by the apocalypse systems are about as varied as D20 systems. And that, you know, in some of them, if you get a critical success, guess what? It's just double damage. But in others, yeah. if you get a critical success, critical success, critical success, <laughs> then you get to add another thing to it and you get a stunt die and a shit blows up and you gain a level and the world explodes and your father falls down from the heavens and says, I was alive the whole time. <laughs> it's, oh my God. It my father is making us. Games. <laughs> and with Powered by the Apocalypse, it's the same. Like some of them add on extra things that like if your roll is 12 plus, then a really cool thing happens or... I've seen some of them that are like, if you get snake eyes, oh no, a horrible thing, the worst possible thing happens. One of your stats like decreases or something. For the most part, it's 10 plus, awesome, seven to nine, okay, and six or less, bend over and take it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like uh, on this, uh, in this setup that it's not. You know, a GM or a dungeon master, the person that runs the game is called the DJ. The DJ, not just the DJ. The AM DJ and or DJ for your sure. character sheets are actually <laughs> rap sheets. You have rap sheets. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you have a list of the character. Uh, so when you build a character in this game, you get what's called a role and you get, I think it's called a background or an origin. What I said, yeah. And then you get some like some your goal or whatever. Uh, so I want to specifically read a book, read a part from it, which is a straight up fucking call out to this movie. I'm looking at the vehicle section specifically. So uh, the vehicle rules, again, are very simple. Uh, whenever all equipment, weapons, gangs, if you have a gang, it's treated as if you just had a weapon that consisted of a lot of people. Vehicles are more or less the same. You just have a handful of stats that extend your own. The vehicle section, uh, car chases, cross-country races, and demolition derbies. How could you have an adventure in 1977 without an awesome car, boat, or even a helicopter? And then there's a cross-out text, or a, 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 a sidebar at the bottom that says, Say what? On vehicle power and fiction. One more time for the folks in the back. Fiction comes first. A semi-truck and a sports car may both have two points of power, but that don't mean they'll perform in the same way. That cab over Peterbilt is never going to keep up with the Pontiac Firebird, and that Firebird's never going to be able to pull a trailer full of Gettysburg beer across the Rocky Mountains. You put them together, Jerry Reed theme song, you got yourselves a winner. That's beautiful. 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 I, I, I like how Harris is like, there's a you know attribute called hustle. Hustle is used for moving quickly and accurately, shooting guns, throwing knives, sleight of hand, and avoiding danger. Hustle is used to, quote, smoke his ass or, quote, get out of the way. Smoke his <laughs> ass. Hustle is the most important attribute for the good old boy and the vigilante role. So the good old boy, for the record, is what the bandit is. Yeah. And I do want to read one of my favorite bits of text here. It's an example of the game in play. It is from the, set, the next page in the vehicle section. It's beautiful. Bo Dupree needs to rescue Karina and Johnny Valentine from a pair of animatronic singing bears from the local Good Time Station pizza parlor. He puts Traveler, 
with two power, two looks, and one point of armor in gear and revs the engine. With the squeal burning rubber, he floors it straight at the bears as they take a moment for a musical interlude. Bo rolls plus power gets 10. Bo chooses to deal great harm and inflicts a total of four points of harm to the androids. Two for Traveler's Power, one for Great Harm, and one because the robots are significantly smaller than a car. Although Big Bubba Bear is pretty sizable, the animatronic bears smash apart. Some bits of banjo bounce against Traveler's windshield. I the, love this game this so, is, so much. This is a game <laughs> I could see like sitting around the table playing this game with Samuel L. Jackson. This would be fun. Samuel L. Jackson, if you are listening, <laughs> please come come here to Portland, Oregon and play this game with us. Like, there are the basic moves. Deliver a beat down. Smoke their ass. Take a hit or get out of the way. Keep your cool. Get in their face. Give someone the third degree. Free your mind. Getting what you want. Scope out a scene and help a brother out. So for those who are unfamiliar in apocalypse world-based games, you don't simply have the freedom to just sort of do anything free form. Everything sort of fits into what's called a move. And a move is simply their way of codifying the things you're going to be doing in this game. Like in D20, you might have a bunch of skills. I'm going to make a spot check. I'm going to make a climb check or whatever. And this, or, or I'm going to roll to attack someone. And the first one was what, Dusty? Deliver a beat down. Deliver a beat down is when you want to attack someone. But it's not like, oh, I want to hit him with my stick. It's... I want to beat this mother to the ground and see what happens. And it's you roll and that's the entire roll. Like it's not a turn by turn blow by blow thing. It's it, you're more interested in what happens next than you are by choreographing each punch, kick and knee to the nuts. Like the, the scene with snowman at what's that word? The choking puke. The choking puke. <laughs> at the choking puke. <laughs> Like, okay, my the way I'm seeing it is he stepped into that choke and puke and he decided to survey the situation, which is what which is called what? Uh survey would be scope out a scene. He decided to scope out the scene and he rolled I would say he rolled somewhere in the middle of the ground. I don't have the results open in front of me. Six I'm, or seven. So yeah, he, he got he got middle ground there, seven to nine. And he probably got a little bit of information, but then uh, he didn't really see it as a dangerous spot. So he wasn't prepared for being jumped like he was. And then when he gets jumped, he probably tried to deliver a beat down. Deliver a beat down. Thank you. Failed at it and got beat up to hell and kicked out of the bar. So I think he rolled a six or less on that. So he got thrown out. However, he steps outside. He immediately says, I'm going to survey this. I'm going to scope the scene again. And he gets a 10 plus on it. And the GM's like, well, you have a truck and they have motorcycles and they're too drunk. And to they're care. all in so, the line. But yeah. in that point, I, I think after he scoped out a scene, when he's in the truck, he would have used uh, the free your mind, which is used to contemplate the current situation and find a solution. See, Dusty, bringing it, bringing it real here. That was even better than my suggestion. You should run this, Dusty, because <laughs> I want to play. <laughs> I'd like to play it, too. So this game is not a 100% matchup with the exact characters of the movie. Unless you think of the, the characters in the movie, we have uh, Bo is clearly a good old boy, and I believe he's got a, a humble background. But... Then you could also say the exact same thing about his buddy. And they basically be the exact same characters, only driving different vehicles. And then Frog, I would say that her role is what we call a honeypot. You want to solve problems with your ways of manipulation. That's what she does. The sheriff probably wouldn't really be a character here. So we'd have two good old boys and a honeypot. Not necessarily going to be the most interesting game. However, if we wanted to take Smokey and the Bandit. To be a, honest, it wasn't the most interesting movie. I mean, I, I know, but let's let's it take fun, it. Let's but. take it as a source of inspiration, as us being a group who does cross state odd jobs for rich folk here in the South. We're gonna we're gonna drive we're gonna drive over cross state lines, and we're gonna do a thing for you. It's gonna cost you some money. So you're gonna have a honey pot, someone who's good at talking. You're gonna want a good old boy, someone who's good at you know that old Southern charm and driving. I would say that instead of another good old boy with a truck, you're going to want that truck driven by a tough guy. 
because you don't want that to happen again. You want him to go into that bar as he's getting his burgers and, you know, you, you want so, him to be just be able to deliver a punch down. That would be a little bit more interesting from a player perspective. It's really hard to do yeah. that in bell bottoms. I mean, yeah. it's almost impossible. <laughs> the other character rules are the bopper. If you want to solve problems with a bunch of thugs at your command. The rocker, if you want to solve problems with your musical talent. The sleuth is if you want to solve problems with quick thinking and deductive reasoning. Sam Rockford. It was it Sam? Sam? Sam, Sam Rockford. Rockwell? No, no. Uh, Rockford Files. Oh, the Rockford Files. Okay. Uh, was it Sam? No, I, I never I watched Sam that Rock, show. I'm thinking Sam Rockwell. I don't remember the Rockford Files character's first name. Uh, and if you want to solve problems with a street howitzer in your hand, choose a vigilante. So we got just pull that from my grandfather's arsenal. Just a howitzer. There we you know. <laughs> <laughs> we got a bopper. We got a good old boy. We got a honey pot. We got a rocker. We got a sleuth. We got a tough guy, and we got a vigilante. That's the 1970s exploitation movies in a nutshell. Yeah, this is the game that I would run. I think other people might have different meanings. I don't necessarily need to run the combats beat by beat. I don't need to roll for every tight turn and every flip through. I think that uh, frequently when he got himself into a tight spot, he just rolled a six or less or maybe he rolled a seven to nine and had to get and give and had to get. get he I'll had say to this. give a little bit. If, if you want to play the movie in an evening, use yours. If you want it to be a campaign, use Car Wars. But with Car Wars, there's no role playing at all, essentially, except as you shout insults at each other over the table. Exactly. That there's nothing Which wrong is with what that. They did in the movie. Yeah, but then you don't have those touching. Except scenes you don't. You don't of, do it over yeah. the. You don't do it over the table. You bring a walkie-talkie. Oh God, that would be everyone gorgeous. has a walkie-talkie <laughs> at the table. Oh my God! And when you announce your moves, you have to step away from the table. <laughs> and you have to use the voice. <laughs> Cover through, break a break of one, nah. Yeah. I don't know. This looks fun. I was, it's a beautiful book. Uh, it's uh, it's in a Powered by the Apocalypse. It's over 300 pages of content. 313 to be exact. Yeah. That's what I would use. I, I've had this for a long time. It I got it from a bundle of holding, which is a website that does... Um, I think once or twice a month, they release these, uh, kind of pay what you want bundles of digital content. Each one has a theme. It's really cool. I got one in an apocalypse world themed, a bundle. And when someone recommend, when, uh, the various people recommended it to me on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram and on Google plus, I looked it up. I was like, "Oh, I own this." <laughs> Google Plus I should is, read it. <laughs> Google Plus is going away, isn't it? Google Plus is going away. So that community, which none of you use, is nope. also going away. But we still have <laughs> Discord, and we have all the other places where you should contact us. Why, oh gosh, how could you find us on Discord? Yeah. That was uh, a question. How can you find us on Discord? <laughs> it's it, we have a link. The link is very simple. It's halfmovieswillgame dot com slash discord i believe there's other things affiliated with us as well how could people find out about, about our wonderful pod first <laughs> <laughs> nicely we done nicely done part of a podcasting group called the breakfast puppies at breakfastpuppies.com. the discord is on the same breakfast puppies host we have a handful of other podcasts including one that's coming up soon in which matthew drinks a bottle of old granddad and tell us, you, tell us about his favorite book <laughs> No. <laughs> and we also have the and, Hammer and, Crawl podcast and the Biker's Dice and Bars podcast. And Matthew, have you gotten that pizza yet? No, I have not. Aw. No one cares enough to drop me five bucks for a Little Caesars pizza. We have a tip jar link in each of our episodes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to throw us a few bucks so Matthew can get a pizza, it's five bucks. We just want to get like a hot and ready from Little Caesars. It's pizza, not going to be the best pizza. <laughs> I will love that pizza like I will never love a child. And we'll take, <laughs> we will take pictures of Matthew loving that pizza. Don't yeah, you want to see those? 18 and over only. <laughs> like love in the pizza. Oh, yeah. So anyway, that's the game wow, that, that I wanted to bring and talk about. 
You wanted you to be talk comfortable about car with sexuality, Dustin. I am you very comfortable with sexuality. Are you though? Yes, I am. Because that scared you. Why did it scare you? Just <laughs> let's unpack this, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's quite all right. <laughs> that's all I got, guys. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Um, we do have a lot of stuff coming up. Has the voting closed for our next? Voting has closed for our next episode. What do we got? It. When did it close? Because I actually voted like it, just. Vo- it closed at 6 p.m. today. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I have our polls for a movie set to auto-close as soon as we start recording. Good. Okay. At 0% of the vote is the greatest swords and sorcery epic of all time. No, it didn't I, win. I really don't Death think, Stalker. I think with 0% there has, that's nowhere near the greatest. Well, our the fans greatest have was my no taste. Yeah, I, I, I will have to agree with you because I'm going to love, I, this, I'll wait. Shut the fuck up. At 11% of the vote <laughs> is this fucking travesty. Why did you vote people? for Beastmaster. That movie is fucking terrible. I'm it sorry. has its moments. You know, it's it terrible. has Rip Torn in it. Come that, on. It, yeah, it has a it moment. It has Kodo and Podo in it. Two ferrets. It has ferrets. Those are good. And it's got these like weird vampire thingies that have wings that hug How people. How many ferrets have been named Kodo and make Podo? Them, I wonder. Like, turn into goo. And Dusty, you have just named the only three interesting things about that whole fucking movie. <laughs> well, However, no, there's the animal sight. There's the, there's the black tiger that they spray painted. <laughs> at 26 percent of the vote is the one that i was actually rooting for which is the scorpion king this is a good movie yeah, yeah it, it is movie. It i is would a have good loved movie. to talk yeah. about Put the, the rock. rock on the map yeah, yeah. and <laughs> finally yes 63 percent of the vote is conan the barbarian as it should be it's a it, good movie it really yeah. should that, that yeah that was the winner to begin with mm-hmm. we all knew it going into it now, are are we going to, when we watch this, because I have the extended version. Is that the one you guys are going to watch? I'm watching the theatrical. Okay. I'm watching whatever I can download on Amazon. Okay. Yeah. To crush all enemies, see them driven before the, you. The extended one has, has, he gives a speech women. at the end about him being yeah, 21. Okay, you've seen it. All right. We're going to be recording in about four weeks because we've got some breaks coming up again because the holidays are kind of busy. I'm getting married uh, on the night that we're next supposed to be recording. I will be getting married. So I'm not really going to be uh, dealing with that. I'm, you know, unless you guys want to, you know, drive out to the coast and not talk even about slightly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like the coast, but I, I, I'm not going to want to interrupt anything for, for us to record this. Yeah. So we don't really have a vote for the next time because we're going to be kind of scattering things out. We don't want to get anybody's hopes up too high. We're just kind of kind of play it by ear for the rest of the holidays and then we'll be back uh so we will be sporadic however we have a year's worth of episodes of cut content and clips yeah we're just going to give you some of the silly so shit stay mm-hmm. tuned for our uh didn't make it into prime time because it was probably too offensive reels coming up soon oh, so you'll be hearing a lot of me <laughs> mostly <Yeah. laughs> probably mostly it's matthew that's all right that's why you tune in anyway right the amount of things that I have to cut that this motherfucker says is just insane. There have there have been some like legit horrible things that have been cut from And you keep Reels. insisting I'm lawful good and I I just I'm saying you guys are crazy. Well you you, know. you have the chewy nuggety center of goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note. Nougat. Nougat. You're a writer. Not nuggety. I said nuggety. You're nuggety. He said nuggety. I heard it. <laughs> You get the chewy nuggety nuggety center. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm on protest. I am not chewy nor nuggety nor nuggety. And I'm Dusty. <laughs> and I'm Nathaniel. Yeah, Thanks for listening, y'all. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're still pretty new to the scene and we love to get your feedback. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. Good or bad, they really help us get the word out. If you want to say hello, drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Have Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production. And our episodes are distributed under CCBYND 4.0 license. 
Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids with introductory narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.